<laughs> and good morning, everyone. I don't know if my, is the sound on? Okay, good morning. And uh, as uh, just said, I'm a Dane, so uh, English is not my first language, uh, it's the second. So uh, I'll, you have to bear with my broken English. And if there's any words I can't pronounce correctly, I'll just ask for help. Is that cool? Yeah, that's great. Um, first, uh, a little reflection from, uh, from yesterday. Uh, we had a wonderful dinner where we shared some uh, interesting stories. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I promise not to tell these stories today. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but uh, in a way, it also said something for me, at least, that uh, all you p great people in here are bringing great stories to the table. And for me, maybe the most important value of uh, this event is what you share together and uh, listen to each other and uh, inspire each other and ask tricky questions. And I really think it's a privilege to be here, honestly. It's a great, great event. Then uh, just a few uh, words on who, I, who am I. Uh, I'm a social activist. <coughs> uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I've started several companies. I'm a politician. I've been voted twice to the local uh, city council in Aarhus, which is the second city of, uh, of Denmark. I'm a troublemaker. Uh, <laughs> I love culture and art. Uh, I'm a son. I'm a, I'm a brother. I have uh, three siblings. Uh, I'm a father to two kids, uh, two sons, grown-up sons. So I'm also a grandfather for, for a great, wonderful little granddaughter. And I'm a gay man. So here I am, uh, standing in front of you. And uh, the reason why I was invited was because uh, I was the founder of the CARES pilot program in, in, uh, in Aarhus in Denmark. And, uh, but I decided not to talk about the CARES pilot. Not directly, at least. Uh, if you have any questions uh, concerning the content of the program and uh, how we select students, what is our leadership model, how do we understand education, how do we create an extremely interesting motivation environment, then uh, please ask questions during the Q&A. Because what I would like to share with you is two small stories. We have only 25 minutes. Two small stories, uh, and uh, it, both stories takes place before uh, Chaos Pilot came into being. The first story is about how good are we to... Can, can we hear the future? So that's the first story. The second story is about uh, what does it take really to say yes, deeply say yes to a new task, a, a big channel. So uh, that's the uh, two stories I would like to share with you. And uh, the introduction to the first story is that you have to rewind. Uh, yesterday we uh, went back to 87, I think. Uh, and uh, the, first or the second presenter told, uh, told us that he was 17 years old in 87 and he got this really interesting idea about climbing uh, Mount Everest. Uh, and actually, we, we are going together back in the in the eighties again. Something interesting happened in the eighties, or maybe we're just old. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, um, from in eighty two, uh, I was hired by the city council of Aarhus to uh, work with inner city kids, trouble kids. Uh, and uh, during the f uh, first seven years, we did all kind of really anarchistic, very anarchistic cultural, uh, cultural activities. We uh, created a, a something co a kind of a circus, uh, an artistic environment for these trouble kids. And uh, we did large scale projects and small scale projects. And it was uh, really uh, quite success in the inner city of, uh, of Aarhus. And then we are uh, around uh, 88 when this story starts, uh, we, we had to fundraise all our money ourselves. We had to, to organize everything ourselves. So what happened was that we had got just gone through a very hard time where uh, not, we were not able to fund, uh, get sponsors behind us. So we, the organization was quite small. And we had an office not bigger than this stage. 
And uh, this was a beautiful May day in uh, 88. And we were three young, uh, quite young uh, guys sitting at the office. Uh, it was called the front, front Runners Office. We created an umbrella organization for all these activities called the Front Runners. It still exists. And it's a kind of a project cradle for young people coming up with great ideas and then they'll get some kind of support to realize the, the, these ideas. So we were sitting in this office and then there was a knock on the door. And uh, we said, of course, come in. And the door opened and in entered a beautiful red-haired woman, young woman. And she said in a very sharp Copenhagen accent, accents, she said, hey guys, do you want to play? <laughs> and we said, what? Uh, what? Uh, you have to understand that there's a competition going on between Aarhus and Copenhagen. And she came from Copenhagen, we were from Aarhus. And uh, I don't know how, how that would work here in the UK and Wales, but uh, there was a, this uh, rich, hey, who are you? Uh, on the other hand, she was really beautiful. <laughs> so, so, so we said, uh, yes, but uh, what, what do you want to uh, uh, play with? <laughs> and she said, uh, we are a group of uh, young people in Copenhagen and we have got this uh, very humble uh, idea, really humble and simple idea. And then there was a, a pa pause and she said, we want to invade Soviet Union. <laughs> and we said, what are you going to do? Are, are, are you going to do, uh, are, you, are you for real? Uh, you want to invade Soviet Union? Then you have to remember who you were able to do that, that Gorbachev was just a rising star. Uh, and he talked about Glasnost and he talked about Peter Stroika. And uh, then we said, what, what, what is your idea? And she said, we want to create a kind of a cultural army. And uh, we would like, in the fall of 89, we would like to in, go, cross the borders of the uh, Soviet Union and heading to Moscow. When we're reaching Moscow, we'll create a huge rock concert on the Red Square in front of Kremlin. And it would be satellite uh, TV to Scandinavia. Are you on? <laughs> and we said, what? Still remember, we have this little <laughs> tiny office and we lacked of money, we lacked of organization. And uh, then this uh, brilliant ideas uh, are presented. And we, s we had to say, of course, yes. Of course we had to say yes. And, um, and the next uh, year we did uh, organize this whole huge event together with uh, our new colleagues in Copenhagen. And in September uh, 89, uh, we were able to start the caravan. We did two caravans. One went through Germany all the way up through Poland and all the way up to Moscow. The other one went up through Sweden into Finland, through Leningrad, that time Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, and all the way up to Moscow. And there we met and uh, we did the event. During the, uh, on, on our way all the way up to Moscow, we did small events uh, on all the cities we passed and talk with the people we met. And, and we, were, we were the first uh, ever uh, foreigners who were allowed to live together with local people in Soviet Union, at that time Soviet Union. So we had a lot of discussion at the kitchen, kitchen tables uh, with ordinary uh, Russian people, drinking a lot of cheap vodka and champagne, and had some deep dialogues, you can imagine that. Uh, and uh, and uh, it, and it, it, it was a really, really interesting experience. It's one of maybe one of the toughest jobs I've ever been involved with. So then uh, it, we come to, it comes to Moscow. Uh, two days before the concert, uh, we uh, got the message that the, the police wanted us to move the concert in front of the uh, Moscow University, but uh, we were able to, uh, to pull t through the, uh, the, the two concerts. And, and uh, it was really something. But that was actually not the most inter interesting part for me. It happened two days after the concert. Because then uh, we were standing on the Red Square. It was an early October uh, uh, day. And uh, it was a bit of rain, snowing uh, weather. Uh, and uh, uh, there were two journal uh, uh, there was a TV crew uh, 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 who wanted to have an interview with me. And uh, one of the journalists asked me, hey, Uffe, now you've been in, in, in the Soviet Union for the last uh, um, one and a half months. 
you have been uh, living together with uh, ordinary uh, uh, Russian people. <coughs> you have been drinking vodka and champagne. Please tell us, when do you really think some deep change will happen in, uh, in the Soviet Union? And I still remember this uh, very special moment where I looked into the camera and I said, something is happening for sure, but I think it will take maybe 10, 15 years before something really deep will happen in the Soviet Union. Because there's lack of hope, there's lack of uh, passion, there's a lack of everything, but people are moving. But, but I think it will take 10, 15, maybe even 20 years before there will be deep change in the society. And what happened? One month after, <laughs> the, the Berlin Wall came down. And, uh, and uh, it surprised everyone. It surprised me. It surprised the media. It surprised FBI, CIA, all the uh, intelligence services around the world. Uh, overnight, the political picture of Europe changed And for me, that was a very, very big uh, lesson concerning are we able to hear the weak signals in society? How do we listen to the future? What, where is the next change wave coming from? And I, I would hope that you're able to just re reflect uh, inside yourself, in your, seen from your own perspective, seen from your own organizations, How well are we organized to really to listen to the weak signals in society? And what, is, what are they telling us? And when will there be uh, enough critical social mass that will uh, experience a tipping point uh, in the different fields of society? So we came home from, uh, from Moscow and then we started to talk about, I and some core uh, uh, members of the front runners, uh, What kind of education should we have had to do what we actually were doing? Because uh, we were at the university, we were, had never been trained to deal with KGB or make con context to the Russian mob or to organize a global event like this, going all the way to the Red Square. We have never been trained for that. So we started to look out in the, uh, in the horizon to figure out, is there any education worldwide dealing with these kind of uh, issues and questions? And we couldn't find it. So we had to in invent this education. And that, was, and that was the reason for the, for the chaos piling coming into, into the world. So for the next uh, one and a half year, we struggled to conceptualize uh, the idea uh, concerning this new uh, creative education. And uh, it, again, it was a, a bit up the hill, and there was one big question was, who should be uh, head of the program? And people starting to say to me, hey, Uffe, you should be the new principal. And I said, no, 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 because in a way I was tired. I have been uh, the front person for maybe 10, 10 years now. So I said, no, I would like to create the education, but I, I would really not want to be the principal. My colleagues were really pushing me, but I said, no, no, no. I don't want to take that responsibility. And then we're coming to the second story because around January uh, 1991, I read a little note in the local newspaper about that every 10 years there is special explosion on the sun. Every 10 years there's uh, special explosions on the sun. And that uh, results in beautiful northern lights in uh, Sweden, up at the polar circle, circle, and I'm now looking down to our Swedish guests, so you know what I'm talking about. So every, every 10 years, there will be special, beautiful northern lights. And I've never seen northern lights. So I decided to uh, uh, ask two of my best friends, saying, would you like to join me and come up to the uh, polar circle to look at northern, uh, northern light? And they said, yes, yes, we would like to do that. So we bought a return ticket to Kiruna. Kiruna is a Swedish city uh, up at the Polar Circle. And uh, we went from Copenhagen up to Kiruna. And uh, during the next week, that was in February 91, during the, uh, the next week we saw beautiful northern lights. And it was Spielberg three times. It was, I don't know if you have ever experienced northern light, but it's really, It, it's really something. The, the colors come f 
exploding in like waves and uh, and uh, yeah it's 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 pure magic one one evening i think it was uh, the fifth day uh, one evening uh, i decided to uh, walk out in the dark it was around 10 o'clock in the evening for myself and uh, i i walked maybe for half an hour and then i came to a special uh, plateau in the in the nature where I was able to look down to a frozen lake, and uh, on each side I had uh, mountains, and it came down like a, like a beautiful uh, cradle in a way. And I, I was standing there, uh, and then uh, waiting for the northern light coming, and then start then it started to come in, floating pieces pieces by pieces, and then started really nearly like music to to color the the sky. And uh, after maybe five, ten minutes, uh, it was like I was standing in stars, looking up in stars. Uh, the light was reflecting into the snow crystal. And uh, during uh, that uh, few minutes, I started uh, to think for myself, if I should be the principal of the chaos pilot, how should the program then look like? And then I started to have all these uh, pictures in my head, how, how the classroom should look like, what kind of furniture there should be in the classroom, what kind of colors the walls should have, what kind of music should come out of the loudspeakers, how should the relationship between the students and the staff look like, what kind of books should be the students be introduced to, what kind of crazy projects should they be involved in, what kind of external uh, sh 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 shareholders should uh, we try to ad identify? How cool th should this uh, program be? How sexy? How provoking? How creative? How wise? How should it look like? And then I started really to feel the energy in my body. And uh, it reached a tipping point where there was a straight connection between what happened in my head, what happened in my heart, and what happened in my body. And suddenly I had this feeling, of course I should be the principal of the chaos pilot. And then I was running all the way from where I was standing and all the way down to the little, little village we uh, were, were staying at in the outside Kiruna. And it was like a hover picture because the village was completely dark. There was a few lights in the windows, but then there was a telephone box. Uh, this doesn't exist anymore. But at that time, there was a telephone box, and there was a, 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 a light bulb uh, in the in the roof, and there was like this all the light coming down, in, like a what do you call it? Uh, yeah. So I was running uh, into this uh, telephone box, grabbed the uh, telephone, uh, and uh, uh, called uh, my colleagues back in Aarhus. And when I got my uh, closest colleague, he answered and he said, "Hey, it's Thomas." And I said, hey, Thomas, I'm on. And I still get the energy when I do this. It's fun. Uh, so, and for me, that was uh, uh, really, uh, again, a lesson to learn. What does it take? What, 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 how was I able to, in a way, to reprogram myself saying, I don't want to do it. And then, because I changed the perspective. You, you s talked about it, uh, changed uh, the lenses widen the lenses uh, and that was what I, I did uh, because we moved all the way up to Kiruna. I was uh, inspired by the northern light. I, I was, for myself, I tried to, to imagine how the future could look like. So I said yes to, to take, uh, take the role as a principal and uh, now I'm standing here uh, 18 years after and, uh, and we did, we, we created the future. We created the future. Uh, so for me, a question for you is, when have you the last time really felt this, uh, this uh, commitment inside yourself to, to do? This is about doing. So what, when have you the last time uh, really experienced this commitment inside yourself really to, to take the next step? And how should your future look like? Are you able to imagine your own future? So these are, 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 uh, are my, my two small stories uh, I, I wanted to share with you. First, uh, are we able 
to to uh, uh, to hear the future coming. Uh, are we able to listen to the weak signals uh, in society and in our own organizations? Um, and then, how can we create a situation for ourselves where we really deeply, deeply feel the connection between what is happening in our head, happening in our heart, and happening in our body? This is the two stories I wanted to share with you.